Lord, we are we're eager. We're eager for heaven. We're eager for that day when you will be our exclusive treasure. And it's a privilege to be able to sing these lyrics now and to even acknowledge that we still need our hearts to be purified. We long for you to be our exclusive joy, our exclusive love, our exclusive treasure. Uh, We cherish the sentiment of Asaph who said so many years ago, earth has nothing I desire beside you. What is there in heaven besides you that we would want? Your nearness is our good. And so, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for drawing near to the brokenhearted. We thank you for um, uh, having intimacy with the upright. Those who are pure in heart are blessed because they will see you. And so, Lord, this is the desire of our heart. This is the cry of our heart this morning. And this song expresses what we long for, Lord, and we want to pour out our hearts to you as your church, that corporately we pray that we could long for you um, in this way, that we would um, cherish you as our greatest delight, our greatest treasure, our greatest joy, our only and exclusive um, affection and object of worship. And uh, this morning, Lord, as we turn our attention to your word, our desire is once again that you would glorify your name and you'd minister to our hearts and do what you alone can do through the power of your word in your church. And to the glory of Christ in the church, we pray this. Amen. All right, you may take a seat. I'm going to invite you to grab your Bibles and open up to Mark chapter 6. We find ourselves in one of the most familiar stories in Jesus' life, the walking on water. Mark chapter 6, verses 45 through 56. I'm going to invite you to follow along as I read. Mark 6.45, Mark writes, Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side to Bethsaida, while he himself was sending the crowd away. After bidding them farewell, he left for the mountain to pray. When it was evening, The boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. Seeing them straining at the oars, for the wind was against them, at about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea, and he intended to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed that it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him. And were terrified, but immediately he spoke with them and said to them, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Then he got into the boat with them, and the wind stopped, and they were utterly astonished. For they had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves, but their heart was hardened. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored to the shore, When they got out of the boat, immediately the people recognized him and ran about the whole country and began to carry here and there on their pallets those who were sick to the uh, the place they heard he was. Wherever he entered villages or cities or countryside, they were laying the sick in the marketplaces and imploring him that they might just touch the fringe of his cloak and as many as touched it were being cured. Jesus walking on water stands out as a remarkable event in the history of the world. And unsurprisingly, the significance of this event is is often missed. Occasionally it's ignored and occasionally it's just deliberately dismissed. And I can give you an example of, of both. Sometimes the significance of this event is ignored because it kind of becomes a metaphor, walking on water. It's just somebody who is inflated with self-significance, and who do you think you are? You know, God, you, 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 this guy walks on water, and we, we kind of turned it into a, a metaphor. It's interesting, Arkent Hughes tells the story of 
one day he visited uh, Cambridge, and as he was walking near um, one of the colleges, a student walked by wearing a, a shirt. It had a, he had a, a black warm-up on, and his T-shirt had uh, in fuchsia red letters, it says, Jesus walks on water. And he saw this young student, and he saw his t-shirt, and he thought, oh man, that's, that's really encouraging. Here's a young Christian who's just bold in his testimony, and he almost stopped him to encourage him. And then he didn't. And later that same day, as he was walking uh, by the River Cam, he was near the Midsummer Common, and he was, there's a bridge there uh, behind Jesus College. And Jesus College is the name of one of the colleges, and Jesus College apparently had a uh, crew team that had, uh, you know, won the University Cup. And so they had spray painted on their bridge, Jesus walks on water in the same colors. And so he remarks about how glad he was he wasn't encouraging this uh, self-inflated crew member on his supposed testimony of Jesus Christ. Sometimes the significance is ignored because we just allude to this reality as something that um, anybody of self-significance would imagine they could do. Uh, sometimes it's actually just dismissed by the distractions and the questions of the critics. It's interesting, this last week I read about one particular theory about what happens in this story as though this wasn't a miracle, and I'll call it the sandbar theory. Uh, it's the idea that, uh, well, certain, certainly Jesus didn't actually do this, but what happened was he was walking on a sandbar and uh, it looked like he was walking on water. Well, ironically, that also would involve a pretty remarkable miracle that uh, you'd have a boat uh, so full of several uh, professional fishermen who made their living on this very lake who did not realize that there was a sandbar three to four miles out in the middle of the lake and that they had never known about it nor never wrecked a ship. Um, the significance of this story is it's found in the details. Surprise, surprise, the significance of Jesus walking on water are found in the details of the story as it's told in the inspired account. And as we go through Mark's story of Jesus walking on water, I'm going to try to highlight for you several of the evidences of Jesus' identity. And my title for this sermon is, Spiritual Insight Comes from Embracing Jesus' Identity. Spiritual insight comes from embracing Jesus' identity. This is a story that's about Jesus' identity as the Son of God, as pretty much every story in the Gospel of Mark really is, ultimately. But this story really takes a, a unique twist because Jesus' identity is so clearly documented in this story, and it's actually contrasted with the response of the disciples. And that contrast is really what drives this story for us this morning. And so we want to pay attention to that as we look at the details. Let's uh, start in verse 45. And let's, let's look for our first evidence of Jesus' identity as the Son of God. And, and that is, a, it's a divine appearance. There's a divine manifestation, a divine appearance, a divine epiphany, if you will. And Christ shows up and in no uncertain terms is showcasing his deity in this story. Verse 45, immediately, so Mark is linking this to the feeding of the 5,000. Um, he actually brought his disciples across the lake, if you remember, to get some, some time with them. He wants to debrief with them, and he still hasn't done that even from their mission when they went out and preached the gospel back in chapter uh, 6, verse 6, all the way through verse 30. They got to this isolated place, but this crowd has been, they, they were pursuing him, they got there ahead of him, and uh, they have military intent. They want to make Christ king, as John 6 documents for us. And so Jesus makes his disciples, he compels his disciples, he just forces them, really. It's a pretty strong word. He just forces them into the boat. He's like, get in the boat, we're embarking, you're on your merry way. I can just imagine him give, putting a heel on the stern of the boat and just pushing them off. You know, get out of here. Go, you, got, you got something you got to do. I got something I got to do. He sends them out to the lake to go across to the other side uh, to Bethsaida. And then he himself is sending the crowd away. He's dismissing everybody. And this verse 45 has caused a, a lot of trouble for um, commentators. And, and I don't think we need to get into a whole host of debate here. But if you're reading your Bibles and you're comparing you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, some of you might have asked this question before because Luke says that in Luke 9.10, he says that uh, this event took place in Bethsaida. And you get to this 
verse 45, and it sounds like he's saying, go to the other side of the sea, to Bethsaida, as if they were going to arrive in Bethsaida. And that certainly wouldn't make any sense. But that actually, it's actually kind of an interesting construction in the original. I, I pressed it, I looked it around for a, a comparison, and I literally couldn't find one until I found some, some really obscure parallel in some secular Greek literature about geography. And a first century guy was talking about a, a trip that somebody was taking from the Peloponnesian Peninsula. I'll give you a little bit of geography here, so just stick with me on this one. The southern tip of Greece, and they use this exact same construction to say that this boat went past the Archelous River up to a group of islands in the northern Greece. And so it uses this exact same construction to, to talk about um, not going to a place, but to say to go opposite of a place to go to a, a different location. And I thought, well, that's a perfect parallel. And it is a very rare construction, and it doesn't occur anywhere in the Greek New Testament or in the uh, Septuagint. But it was a perfect parallel. So I, I just think that the, the way to read this is they're very close to Bethsaida. He sends them to go opposite to the other side, opposite of Bethsaida. And then that makes perfect sense of the grammar and this really strange construction. And it makes perfect sense of all four accounts. So that's all I'll say about it. I'm totally satisfied. If that was never a concern for you, then count your blessings. We're on our way. <laughs> I just, it was such, such a, like, a, I, had to, I had to scratch that itch. So thank you for just letting me, let me do that publicly. Verse 46, after bidding them farewell, he left for the mountain to pray. And this is a, such a, a profound verse. In a story that is so eminently about Jesus' identity as the Son of God, in a gospel that is so preeminently about Jesus' identity as the Son of God, the Son of God spends the night in prayer. Think about that for a second. He doesn't just float through life as if every detail of this man, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, was just spent walking on water, escaping human realities, almost relying on divine nature in some way to avoid a very real human dependence on his father. Don't think that for a second. He absolutely was God and is God. He always has been God in the past, eternity past, always will be God to eternity future. That's not even in question. But don't think that that means he actually didn't have a very real human existence. In this very verse, we see the Son of God in a very real human dependence looking to his Father. Dependent. He is not self-reliant. He is pouring out his heart to his Father in Prayer, And this is so poignant for a story that so prof profoundly documents his deity. And here we see his humanity as well. Verse 47. When it was evening, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. And so here it is. He's praying straight through the night. This boat is out in the middle. In fact, John 6, verse 19 is very specific. And it says in John 6, 19, when they had rowed three to four miles. So they're three to four miles into a sea that's only, it's a lake. It's only six miles across. And so they are out in the middle. Verse 48, seeing them straining at the oars, for the wind was against them, about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. Now, this is interesting because uh, even the word straining, um, uh, the NES has a footnote, harassed. Uh, the, the, if you look it up in the Greek dictionary, it's just the word for tormented. They are being tormented at the oars. They are just getting worked. They are getting after it, and they feel like they're getting nowhere. They're going against this intense wind. The wind's against them, and it's about the fourth watch of the night. That would have been a Roman watch. The Greeks had three watches. The Romans had four watches. And so this would have been 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., and they're out there in the middle of the sea. He comes to them walking on the sea. And that's really all it says about him walking on water. You know, it's interesting in Matthew's parallel, it records the story of Peter walking on the water. Mark doesn't talk about that. It just says, Jesus just comes out on the water. Here he is, comes walking over to them. And the last phrase of the verse should cause us to pause. Mark records 
the intention of Jesus, this is something that Jesus was intending to do, and he says he intended to pass by them. Now, the question I'm asking when I see that statement is, well, what, what's, what's, this, what's significant about this? First of all, this, this phrase, this statement, is not included in any of the parallels. Uh, we, got, we have three, three accounts, Matthew, Mark, and John. None of those three accounts record this phrase. But secondly, what, what would this accomplish? I mean, okay, so Jesus is intending to pass by them. What would that accomplish? And we could kind of surmise, we maybe were guess, well, like, was that just kind of showing them in clear and un, no uncertain terms? I'm making better progress than you, walking, while you are getting tormented and getting owned at the oars. You're just getting worked, and let me just walk past you, casually, effortlessly. What, what's going on here? And it's, it's true. He is <laughs> making better progress. He just cruises the three or four miles just at walking speed, and they've been doing it all night in the, with the oars. The, the question is, though, why is he doing that? And the answer is because of who he is. He, because of who he is. That's why he's doing this. But we don't want to give up on gaining insight into the significance of this phrase, he intended to pass them by too quickly. It's, a, it's an important phrase. And especially as we study the rest of this story, as we're going to see, we've got about four really significant indications of Jesus' deity in this very story. And this is certainly one of them. It's a strange phrase. We don't have any parallels in the New Testament that I'm aware of. But we do find some parallels in the Old Testament. And let me show you a few of these. I'm just going to do a chronological survey of, in special revelation of this phrase of passing by, and particularly poignant uses of that term, starting in the book of Job. So turn with me real quickly to Job chapter 9. And in Job 9, Job is talking. He's interacting with his friends. His friends are trying to counsel him with some unhelpful theology. And Job is, Job is speaking here, and let's pick it up in verse, um, verse 8. Speaking of God, and he's, he's really defending God's right to do whatever he wants. So in the face of kind of an ancient version of karma, he's telling his friends, look, God has, he, might not, he might have reasons we don't know about, but it's not as though he would, the only reason why I'm suffering, guys, is because I just committed some un, you know, sin that I'm unwilling to give up. God has his reasons. And of course, he's going to demand that God give him those reasons, and that's where he starts to sin. But he's certainly not sinning here when he's just saying God can do whatever he wants. And in Job 9, verse 8, speaking of God, it says, who alone stretches out the heavens and tramples down the waves of the sea. Skip down to verse 11. Were he to pass by me, I would not see him. Were he to move past me, I would not perceive him. I mean, God stretches out the heavens. He walks on water. And if he passed you by, you wouldn't even recognize him. You couldn't see him. That's just an interesting phrase. That's an interesting thought. And that's really the first time you see this term used of God. So hold on to that thought, and let's look at a couple more. Let's go back, and now we're going backwards in our Bible, but future in time to the life of Moses. Let's go to Exodus 33. Exodus 33 and 34. This is the, the story where Jesus, um, I shouldn't say Jesus, that's, it is Jesus, but Christ, before he became Jesus, this is where Christ reveals himself to Moses on the top of Mount Sinai. Let's pick it up in Exodus 33, verse 19. Well, actually, let's just go back to 18, because that's where Moses begins this, this um, request. He says to God, I pray you, show me your glory. Moses is speaking to Yahweh on the top of the mountain, and God says, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you. I'll make my goodness pass by you. And, and will proclaim the name of Yahweh before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will show compassion to whom I show compassion. 
And then in verse 22, it says, It will come about while my glory is passing by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Yahweh can say, I'm going to pass all of my goodness by you. I'm going to pass all my glory by you. And when I pass my glory and my goodness past you, Moses, I'm going to reveal myself verbally with proclamation, a word. That's how I'm going to reveal myself to you. And this is a manifestation of God's glory. And then it actually happens in 34 verse 6. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed. His glory goes past, his goodness goes past, and God starts revealing himself verbally with propositions so that Moses is not consumed but still gets to know who God is. Yahweh, Yahweh God, compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth. And he goes on to reveal his name and his character. This is a an appearance of God and his glory, God and his goodness. Let's look at one more example. Look at 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings 19, verse 11. Same location, different individual, namely Elijah. On Mount Sinai, which is called Horeb here, two different names for the same mountain. Let's pick it up in, in verse 9. First Kings 19, verse 9. Then he came there to a cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And so he said, Go forth and Stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord was passing by. And a great strong wind was rendering, rending the mountains and breaking in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of gentle blowing When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in the mantle, and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And then he goes on to speak to him what his will is for him in the following verses. Moses and Elijah have an epiphany from God Almighty, and God passes by, and his goodness passes by, his glory passes by. That's the only parallel we have. In Mark chapter 6, Mark documents that Jesus intended to pass them by. That's not coincidence. Mark, uh, there's no detail we've seen in the Gospel of Mark. There's no detail we will see in the Gospel of Mark. It's a throwaway comment. This is not a throwaway comment. It's, It's important, and it's deliberate. Jesus intends to pass them by. And sure, There's an effectiveness to his walking that supersedes their rowing. Sure, but why is that? It's because of who he is. This is the appearance of God. God is showing up next to their, in their boat. Verse 49, when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed that it was a ghost and they cried out. You know, this this word is where we get our word phantom from. Phantom, ghost, night specter, some sort of vision. Man, we've been rowing too hard. I'm hallucinating. Whatever they were thinking. One, di- one dictionary says just a, a mental imagination. They're actually thinking, I see something. It looks like a person on the water. So obviously, I'm imagining it. Obviously, it's not real. That's their conclusion. That's the only conclusion they can come to. Verse 50. For they all saw him and were terrified. Of course they're terrified. They're thinking, what is going on? What is this? And then Mark records, but immediately he spoke with them and said to them, and it's just an interesting parallel to the verbal revelation of God's glory passing by both with Moses and with Elijah. And here Jesus is passing by and then he starts speaking verbally to the disciples as well. And what he tells them is, take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. Take courage, it is I. 
do not be afraid. And this is our second evidence of Jesus' identity as the Son of God. It's a divine claim. It's a divine claim. In fact, what's interesting about this, this quote here, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. The phrase, it is I, is a, is a phrase uh, in Greek, ego e me. It just means I am. I am. And it could just mean Jesus is identifying himself like, hey guys, don't worry, it's, it's just me. Just, just me. No big deal. He could be saying that, potentially, just from the grammar. But that would make no sense of the context. Some have asked the question, is this a divine claim? When Jesus says, I am here, is this a divine claim? And I would absolutely affirm that it's a divine claim. But I understand some who say that this is not a divine claim, they're they're quick to point out that these words could be used just in normal, kind of perfectly colloquial Greek. You know, um, there's a few examples of this in the scriptures. For instance, in John 9, you remember in John 9, there's the man who was born blind? And they're having this debate after he gets healed. They're saying, oh, he's just, he looks like the guy who was born blind. And, and, and the, the blind man, the former blind man, says, no, it's me. I'm the one. I think it's translated, I am the one. And it's just ego me. It's just, it's, it's me. I'm, I am the guy. So it's not like I don't look like him. It's just, I actually am that guy. So he's claiming to, that's his identity. And so that's just how it could be used. The disciples use the phrase in Matthew 26 when they're asking the question, is it, is it, is it me? Because uh, Jesus said, You're, someone's going to de- betray me. And they're saying, it, it, surely it's not I. And that same phrase is within a longer sentence that the disciples are saying. And of course, it's not a divine claim there. So understandably, there are contexts where this is not a divine claim. But this is not one of them. Interestingly, one commentator who doesn't believe this is a claim to deity um, uses, point, points out, you know, uses the parallel, John 6, verse 20, to say it's, it's not a claim of deity. John 6, 20 is the parallel account of the walking on the water written by the, the apostle John, and in John's account, Jesus says, I am. And he says, that's not a claim to deity. Well, the problem with that is John is so meticulous in how he constructed his gospel. So meticulous. I mean, in John's gospel, you have seven signs. And he starts numbering them. The first sign in chapter 2, the second sign in chapter 4, and he starts showing these signs to show that Jesus is the Messiah and you can believe in him, have life in his name. That's the whole purpose of that gospel. And there's seven signs documenting Jesus' identity. Again, John also constructs his gospel by giving us seven discourses. For example, the new birth discourse, the water of life discourse, the bread of life discourse, and so on. There's seven discourses in the gospel of John. I mean, without fail. Seven signs, seven discourses, and then we should not be surprised that there are seven I am statements with a predicate. Jesus says, I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, I am the door for the sheep, I am the good shepherd. He says, I am with with some other predicate seven times. And we should not be surprised that in John's gospel, Jesus says, I am with no predicate seven times. And if John 6, 20 is not one of those instances, well, then he's just incomplete with that one. Or, I don't know, stopped writing too soon. I don't know what, you, you just, it's so clearly a claim of deity, I am. This is a technical phrase in the Old Testament. And let me show you what's going on here. All of the evidence in this story, it's, it's with all the evidence of his deity, it's clearly a divine claim. And we should not forget the thesis of Mark, Jesus is the Son of God. We also should not forget how Mark began his gospel by quotes from the Old Testament, namely a compilation of quotes from three books. Do you remember what they are? This is like a quiz, a little review quiz here. Um, Exodus, Isaiah, and Malachi. He's building off of those three prophecies in very direct and distinct ways. And when you look at, let's go back real quick to Isaiah, and let's look at this, this phrase, this ego me phrase, I am. And it's used, God uses it of himself as a self-identifier throughout the prophecy of Isaiah. And so the quote that um, Mark begins his gospel with comes in Isaiah chapter 40. And we're going to see, let me just show you a few instances of this um, starting in chapter 41. So you're going to want to actually be in Isaiah because there's a lot of them. And we're just going to start working through several of these instances. Start in Isaiah chapter 41 and look at verse 4. Who has performed and accomplished it, calling forth the generations 
from the beginning. I, the Lord, am the first, and with the last, I am he. And that's the same phrase in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Ego me. I am he. That's his identifier as being Yahweh. I am. Look at chapter 43, verse 10. Chapter 43, verse 10. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand, here it is, that I am he. Before me, there was no God formed, and there will be none after me. That statement, I am, on the lips of God, is a claim of incomparable deity. There's no one else besides him. He's not just leading the pack in the competition, clamoring among beings for the label God. He's the only one in the race. Look at chapter 43, verse 25. Here it happens twice. I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgression for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. And this is a mark of his deity is that he wipes out transgression for his own reputation, for the sake of his own character. Look at Isaiah chapter 45, verse 8. Drip down, O heavens, from above. Let the clouds pour down righteousness. Let the earth rip open, uh, sorry, let the earth open and salvation bear fruit and righteousness spring up. And with it, I, the Lord, have created it. And so there it's, with the predicate, I am Yahweh. Look at verse 18. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, he is the God who formed the earth and made it. He established it and did not create it a waste place, but formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is no one else. And there it is again with the predicate. I am Yahweh. Verse 19, there it is with the predicate again. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I am the Lord who speaks righteousness. The next one is in verse 22. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. And there's the predicate God. The predicate I am God. That's who I am. Look at uh, chapters 46, verse 4. Even to your old age, I will be the same. Even to your grain years, I will bear you. I have done it. I will carry you. I will bear you. I will deliver you. Here, in this one, it happens twice. Uh, I am the same, and I, will, I am the one who bears you. Look at chapter 47, verse 8 and verse 10. These are the only two examples in from 40 to 66 of the, this ver- verbiage being used not of God. It is a blasphemous claim on the part of arrogant idolaters claiming they are going to be like God, and they use that same language of themselves. This is shocking. Verse 8, now hear this then, you sensual one who dwells securely, who says in your heart, I am, and there's no one besides me. I will not sit as a widow, nor no loss of children. They claim I am, and there's no one besides me. That's, that's, that's verbiage of God. Look at verse 10. You felt secure in your wickedness and said, no one sees me. Your wisdom and your knowledge, they've deluded you. For you have said in your heart, I am, and there is no one besides me. And there they're using I am without a predicate. Look at Isaiah 48, verse 12. Listen to me, O Jacob, even Israel, whom I called, I am. I'm the first, I'm also the last. He's the beginning, he's the end. He is the God who called Jacob. Look at chapter 51, verse 12. I, even I, that's where it is, it's I am right there. I am, I am he who comforts you. Who are you that you are afraid of man who dies and the son of man who is made like grass? If God is the one who is, we shouldn't be afraid of anyone or anything. And finally, look at Isaiah 52, verse 6. Therefore, all my people shall know my name. Therefore, in that day, I am the one who is speaking. Here I am. And there it is again. And we just see it over and over and over again. This claim on the lips of Yahweh saying, I am, I, I am he, I am the one, I am the only, I am exclusive. There's no one like me. There is no other. There's no other God formed besides me. I am it. I am. And of course, you remember uh, from our introduction to the Gospel of Mark that Mark is building on the, prophet, on the statement of, from Exodus 23 about the angel of the Lord. And if you remember, the angel of the Lord actually shows up in the burning bush. And so just 
briefly, look at Exodus chapter 3 for a second. You remember this angel of the Lord, which is the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ, he speaks to Moses from the burning bush. Exodus 3, 2, the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And you skip down to this um, speech that he gives to Moses when Moses asks the question, who am I that I should go? And um, God says, I'm going to be with you. And, and then Moses says, look, they're going to ask me who sent me and, and who should I tell them sent me in verse 13. And the answer comes in verse 14. God says to Moses, which is the angel of the Lord, angel of the Lord is God, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And he goes on to identify himself as Yahweh, this messenger also sent by Yahweh. Wow, this is incredible. Jesus walking on water, intending to pass by the disciples, saying to them, Ego e me, don't be afraid. This is a clear and unambiguous claim of deity to the disciples. And let's go back to Mark chapter 6. And let's keep, keep making progress here. We're working toward a conclusion. And the, what is the proper conclusion we should make of all of this? Well, we've seen... Jesus' identity as the Son of God in the divine appearance in verse 48. We see it in the divine claim in verse 50. And the third one in verse 51, in the very next verse. Then he got into the boat with them, and the wind stopped. The storm just ended. The wind stopped, and they were utterly astonished. This sounds vaguely familiar, doesn't it? Remember Mark chapter 4? I mean, we've already seen this. Mark chapter 4 Verses 38 to 41, Jesus himself was in the stern. He was asleep on the cushion and they woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care that we are perishing? Because they were in a storm. He gets up in verse 39. He rebukes the wind and says to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? How is it that you have no faith? They became very much afraid. And said to one another, who then is this? Who is this? That even the wind and the sea obey him. His authority over the storm causes them to ask the question, who is this? And they are still, to some degree, struggling with the answer to the question of Jesus' identity. So here he is, walking on the water, passing by them, the glory of God, the the goodness of God, passing by these disciples, claiming, ego in me, I am, there's no other, and he gets in their boat, it gets perfectly calm. They should not be astonished. Now, I don't want to sound like I'm rebuking them unfairly because the word astonished in English might sound like, well, I'd be astonished if I saw that. I'm astonished just listening to the story. And I can appreciate that. We should all be astonished because this is amazing. But the the word astonished doesn't just mean amazed, like, wow, that's really impressive. Astonished has has an interesting connotation. And the idea is that you're just literally outside of your mind. It's just like you can't make sense of what you're seeing. Struggling to come to grips with reality. And they are blown away, and and they ought not to be. And we're going to come back to verse 51b and 52, because this really becomes the contrast to Jesus' clearly revealed identity. Um, uh, As the disciples are hardened, and they are not gaining the insight that they need. Here's why they don't have the insight. is because they are still struggling to come to grips with Jesus' identity. Last evidence of deity comes in verses 53 to 56. And that's the divine healings after crossing the sea. In verse 53, they get to the other side. They come to dry land at Gennesaret. Gennesaret would be the plains on the west. So this would basically be between Capernaum and uh, Tiberias on the western shore. They moored to the shore. Verse 54, they got out of the boat. Immediately the people recognized him. And they ran about the whole country. So they immediately recognize him. They become his PR. They spread the word everywhere. And now he has just mobs and mobs of people. They're bringing people on pallets. They're bringing in. It's like every hospital and every urgent care is just getting evacuated. And they're bringing them straight to Jesus. 
And in verse 56, wherever he entered villages or cities or countryside, they're laying the sick in marketplaces, imploring that they might even touch the fringe of his cloak. And here the sick and even defiled or unclean are touching him who is always clean and their curse is being reversed simply by the touch. As many as touched him were being cured. And it's interesting that... um, There's another parallel here with what happened with the crossing of the Red Sea in Exodus. In Exodus 15, just just listen here, don't turn, turn. I'm just going to read this to you. Exodus 15, verses 22 to 26, Moses writes that then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah. So the people grumbled at Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And then he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, and he threw it into the waters, and the waters became sweet. There he made for them a statute and regulation, and there he tested them. And he said, If you will give earnest heed to the voice of the Lord your God, and you do what is right in his sight, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all of his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you, which I have put on the Egyptians. For I, the Lord, am your healer. Yahweh is their healer. And Mark Horn rightly concludes, Jesus is their healer now, just as he was their healer then. Jesus is the Son of God. He's the Son of God, whether you believe it or not. That's just who he is. It's not up for debate. It's not up for a vote. Jesus is the Son of God. He rules all. He created it all. He's the one to whom every soul created in his image will bear account. He's God. This profound story gets quite a little twist in verses 51 and 52. Notice in 51b, when Jesus gets into the boat, they were just utterly astonished. Literally, the one definition of that word astonished means to cause to be in a state in which things seem to make little or no sense. They just experienced the walking on water. And they weren't introduced to this as children in Sunday school. This is reality unfolding in front of them. And they've never even imagined something like this taking place before. And Jesus gets into their boat and immediately it's calm and they are struggling. They're caused to be in a state where they are really not able to make, they're making little or no sense of reality as it's happening, as it's unfolding in front of them. They're confused, dazed and confused, confounded. They're outside their mind. Their minds are blown. They don't even have a category for what they're uh, seeing and experiencing. And, And they ought to have a category for what they're seeing and experiencing. They ought to because verse 52 says, For they had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves, but their heart was hardened. How helpful is that verse? See, they've already seen Jesus feed the 5,000. They they know he's the shepherd of the sheep. And he's willing to even meet physical needs in order to meet spiritual needs. They've seen that. They understand that. They've been exposed to these realities. And they didn't gain the insight that they ought to have gained from those realities. Because their heart was hardened. Their heart was hardened. They were, they were not getting what they, they should have. And so, here this becomes a, a rebuke and a warning for us. We gain a remarkable benefit into Mark's purpose with these two verses when we compare this story with Matthew. And I want to just do this for a second. Let me show you the parallel in Matthew. And in Matthew 14... We read the same account, and this might surprise you. In verse 32, this is where the story is the same. When they got into the boat, the wind stopped. Of course, he also adds the detail about Peter getting out of the boat. So now when they're getting into the boat, it's it's Jesus and Peter, of course. Um, Not that, that Mark disagrees with that, it's just that he doesn't record that. Here's a detail in Matthew that we don't find in Mark. Verse 33. And those who were in the boat worshipped him, 
saying, you are certainly God's son. What? Isn't that the thesis of Mark? So Mark, why, why wouldn't you record that detail? That's, in, that's, in, that's incredible. Oh, how insightful is this? They did say those words. There's no, different, there's no, there's no contradictory element in this story. Both, both stories are absolutely flawless and perfect as they are told, and none of the details are, are, uh, can't be meshed together in perfect harmony. But the point is, Matthew wanted us to recognize and he wanted us to know that they actually claimed at that point that, yes, you are certainly God's son. They can say that. And Mark wants us to appreciate this detail, that they didn't have the insight that they ought to have had. They are dazed and confused and confounded, not able to make sense of what they're seeing to some degree, even though they can say, I do agree and I can come to the conclusion and I can say the words, Jesus is the Son of God, they are still not appreciating the implications of that reality. They have not yet embraced that reality the way that they are. And how helpful is this to have to recognize once again, it's easier to say Jesus is the Son of God than to embrace it, to believe it, and to live it. They know that it's true, They've seen these evidences, but the question of our theology is not so much how would we answer that question on a quiz, is Jesus the Son of God, true or false? The, the better question of that, the better test of that theology is how do we do in the storm? And that's really the better test. It's important we see the Contrast between the identity. They, they, they've, they've embraced, they've deduced his identity as the Son of God, but they haven't embraced it. And remember, in this situation, they're in this situation because Jesus made them get in this situation. He's the one who forced them into the boat. He's the one who kicked that thing off the shore. He's the one that sent them out into the middle of the lake. They are here because he put them there. If they'd really embraced Jesus' identity or the implications of who he is, they would have still rowed. They wouldn't have been without responsibility. They would have still rowed at the, at the wind, but their rowing would have been just as full of prayer as Jesus' night had been. They would still have been relieved when the storm was over, but they wouldn't have been dazed and confused without a category to make sense of reality there. They would not have been astounded in, in the sense that Mark records, an astounding astonishment that flows out of a hard heart, struggling to embrace Jesus' sovereign and divine ordering of your universe, let alone my own personal universe. Consider that this storm is exposing the disciples in the very area where these men are supposed to have experience, knowledge, and ability at least four of them are professional fishermen, and this is the lake where they make their living. God is showing them that they have no ability to control the storm or secure their safety. If we had spiritual insight that we so desperately need, if we truly embrace Jesus' identity as the Son of God, then we would not fear in the midst of the storm. If we embrace Jesus' identity as God, we would gladly let him be God and rejoice that we are not. We'd give thanks to him for his sovereign intervention, even when it goes against our own desires. Consider the words of uh, John Flavel. He says this, he says, If you could but see how God in his secret counsel has exactly laid the whole plan of your salvation, even to the smallest means and circumstances, could you but discern the admirable harmony of divine dispensations, their mutual relations, together with the general respect that they all have to the last end. And had you liberty, if you had the freedom then to make your own choice, you would, of all the conditions in the world, choose that in which you now are. What a great implication if we embrace the implications of Jesus' identity as the Son of God. We would have no quarrel with whatever storm 
we would say, that's this exactly the storm I want to be in because he put me there. A couple weeks ago, I was talking with Bobby Casillas and he mentioned a Q&A from Shepherd's Conference that made an impact on me and I, I pulled it up just to get the uh, precise wording. Um, Pastor John MacArthur was in this Q&A and he was talking about some of the challenges that their church faced uh, with LA County and during the COVID crisis and some of the litigations and he was just describing how, you know, just how the Lord, he just knew the Lord was putting his glory on display and he didn't know how it was going to unfold and he's just looking at these incredible um, circumstances and just describing, I, didn't, I wasn't worried, you know, I wasn't worried about getting arrested in contempt of court and walking through some of those details. And here, here's, here's the line that he said, I'm just going to read it to you. He said, my favorite place to be is in a situation that has challenges and I don't know the way out because then I can just be faithful and not try to orchestrate things and let God do what he will do. And that's exactly right. That's exactly where we ought to live. Fearless in the face of the storm because we're following the Son of God. What storm could we possibly face that would warrant fear if obedience to Christ got us there? If your obedience turns into a spiritual storm, don't fear. He has it under control. I want to close with the two verses from Isaiah. Isaiah 41.10 Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Isaiah 43.2 When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, I'm sorry, yeah, and through the rivers, they will not overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. Father, thank you so much for giving us this incredible account of your son walking on water. Just to see Christ and to see a very true and very real epiphany, even doing exactly what he had, did, had done many times before in the Old Testament. And here he is putting your glory and his own glory on display as he walks past the disciples, as he claims to be the incomparable God who knows no beginning or no end and who has no other competition. And as he authoritatively silences the storm and as he profoundly removes disease from Israel, we are impressed and we are compelled and yet lord we also must com, com, well we must we must say it with honesty and say we believe but help our unbelief thank you for this example of these disciples and these disciples are you know they're they're just like us they've been given truth and they've been given evidences and you are so kind and so patient to teach these disciples what they needed to learn to be useful for you. You calmed the water not once, but twice. You fed thousands not once, but twice. You talked to them about the same spiritual lessons, not once, not twice, not a dozen times, many times. And to think of your patience and your kindness and your grace to uh, disciples who lack insight at times that we so desperately need. We're so thankful for your condescension and we pray, Lord, that we would embrace your self-revelation, the self-attesting revelation of who you are, that we would believe it, that we would embrace it. We, at times, might be like the disciples, saying, yes, we know that you're the Son of God. Yes, we know that you've got it under control, but, Lord, we want to believe it, we want to live it, we want to give you the glory you so richly deserve, uh, not by just anticipating the storm being over, but by living fearlessly in the midst of the storm, knowing that you have it under control. You deserve that kind of glory, Lord, because you're that kind of God. And so, Lord, we need your help. Thank you again for this incredible attestation of your, your son's deity. And, Lord, we want to embrace his identity so that we would have the spiritual insight we need to be faithful to you, to honor you, and to serve you well. 
So we know that you'll answer this prayer because that's the kind of prayer you love to answer. It's in line with your will. Do that for us as a church. Do that for the sake of Phoenix and for the sake of the lost that would be ministered to through this body. We beg of you. In your name we pray. Amen.